The second area of our concern as historians looking at the civil rights movement is also the second area in which African Americans were concerned to gain equal rights and equal access to the white community. And that is in the area of public accommodations. Now, during the 19th century, we see Supreme Court and, and other jurisdictions favoring property rights over human rights and over individual rights. The, the Supreme Court under Earl Warren began um, holding up, upholding individual rights over property rights. And though we do not talk in this lecture about any particular court case like Brown v. Board uh, under education, the Supreme Court made it very clear and federal courts, particularly the, um, uh, the Middle District of Alabama under Frank Johnson Jr., made it very clear that the court was swinging in favor across the board of, um, of supporting individual personal rights above the rights of, of uh, property. Now, this is most obvious in, or, or the, the manifestation of this in the civil rights movement was the movement for uh, rights to equal public accommodations. And it's here where a, 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 the, the, the social infrastructure that had grown up around Jim Crow laws uh, had created an actual physical infrastructure and an economic infrastructure. That is a middle class of black businesses, um, in some cases, very well-to-do black business people uh, like um, uh, A.J. Gaston of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, stood to lose a great deal when integration removed their client base, their customer base, um, you know, their, their kind of trapped customer base um, because the, the civil rights movement to gain uh, access regardless of race to public accommodations was ultimately uh, successful. Well, where did this movement begin and where do we see it what is its trajectory? What were the main events in this? And this is the nature of the, of the survey courses that uh, a little like high school, unfortunately, we just try uh, to go, we, we try to ensure that you have a base of, of factual knowledge, of event-based uh, knowledge, of database knowledge, um, and so that you can go on and make uh, informed interpretations supported by evidence. Um, I have made an interpretation, um, a claim that they succeeded, uh, African Americans succeeded in uh, gaining public accommodation access. So I'm supporting it now with some evidence. And this is what you can do as well, um, particularly in your papers, for example. So uh, how, how did this movement go? Well, we see uh, everybody believes that the public accommodations movement began kind of sui generis, out of nothing, um, with Rosa Parks, a, the myth of, of which is that Rosa Parks was a tired uh, seamstress after a hard day who just simply couldn't bring herself to give up a seat on the bus, uh, and so was arrested, and automatically a bus boycott began. Um, well, there's a little bit of truth to that, but um, there, there had been, uh, I, I guess you can say in the, the aftermath of World War II that the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott really did launch the um, uh, accommodations uh, drive for the civil rights movement, but it was not unplanned. It was not uh, unprecedented as early as 1906. Um, African Americans had boycotted public transportation uh, in the Deep South in an effort to demonstrate their economic power and had won some um, concessions in the 1906 streetcar uh, strike in Birmingham. But uh, Jim Crow laws being what they are, they became stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, and uh, even if the uh, uh, city, like in Montgomery, did not pass Jim Crow laws. The bus company 
indeed had Jim Crow policies. So um, how did this work? Well, uh, there was a line, sometimes imaginary, and in the case of, um, of Birmingham, Alabama, it was a very real line marked by a movable um, a, a, a sign connected to a bus seat um, that marked the place in front of which um, white people could sit and in back, in back of which black people could sit but most often stand because blacks made up the overwhelming majority of people using the buses in the great metropolitan areas of, of the South, which, you know, great metropolitan area and South, a little bit oxymoronic, um, kind of mutually exclusive like jumbo shrimp. But um, um, in, in Montgomery, during 1955, uh, the, uh, the NAACP affiliate of, um, uh, of Montgomery, of which Rosa Parks was the secretary and E.D. Nixon uh, was the president, uh, had been hunting for a case that they could take to court, because that's what the NAACP did, was to take cases to court to challenge the bus company's right to require blacks to sit in the back. And it wasn't just sitting in the back. There was a whole bevy of things that occurred to um, African-Americans. For example, they could they got on the front of the bus, paid their fare. This is in Montgomery. Paid their fare, got back off of the front of the bus, went to the back door and got back on uh, at the back door. Now, that you might say, well, okay, that's just a little thing. I mean, it's, it's incredibly humiliating. Uh, but bus drivers always thought it was great fun just to drive off. So basically, there was institutionalized theft uh, from African Americans. When, when a soldier, uh, that, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name, when, when a soldier in, I believe, 1947 um, had this happen to him, he ran the bus down, jumped onto the bus, started yelling at the bus driver, um, he was removed by two policemen who were standing there. Cops were all over the place at the time. Removed by two policemen, subsequently shot and killed in, in a fight uh, with the cops. They, they then tried to cover up um, this fight uh, and their, their shooting of this guy, which indicates that eh, there, there may have been something hinky going on. Um, anyway, in 1955, um, a young woman had refused to move. She was unmarried, 15, uh, pregnant, and was pitching a fit. So she was not a particularly good test case. You wouldn't win in the court of public opinion with uh, uh, with Miss Colvin, uh, which was her last name. But Rosa Parks saw her opportunity. Rosa Parks, very straight-laced, middle-aged, uh, perfect for public opinion in the mid-1950s, and rode two blocks before she was required to move and refused to do so and subsequently arrested. Interestingly enough, this entire incident took place about two blocks from the Troy University Montgomery campus, just up, up um, uh, the road from where Troy University Montgomery campus is now. Okay, so Rosa Parks refused to relinquish her seat on the bus she was arrested. She was sure she was tired. She was a seamstress. It was the uh, it was December. It was the holiday season. Um, she was going home, but she also saw her opportunity to become the test case. When it was uh, revealed that she was um, uh, had been the one that was arrested, you know, word got around fast. But then people didn't know it was Rosa Parks. Everybody was shocked, shocked that it was Rosa Parks. Um, uh, E.D. Nixon was completely floored that it was Rosa Parks. Well, they scraped up her bail, went and bailed her out of jail. Um, and over that weekend, that happened on a Friday, and over the weekend, um, uh, Joanne Robinson and other people um, from, from what is now Alabama State uh, got together and decided to call a mass meeting that would go beyond merely suing. And eventually that meeting on Monday called for a bus boycott. Now, at this juncture, uh, the NAACP uh, organization organized a separate body called the MIA, the Montgomery Improvement Association, 
literally that that same Monday. And it had the same board as the NAACP uh, Montgomery affiliate, but it was a distinct organization. Uh, and it was the one that coordinated the Montgomery bus boycott. Now, one of the people that got involved with the boycott upon request of the MIA was the very charismatic, very new, very young preacher at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, which is about a block away from uh, the Alabama State Capitol at the other end, the east end of Dexter Avenue from where the arrest of, of Rosa Parks had taken place. Anyway, Martin Luther King Jr., became the public face of the Montgomery bus boycott, which he had no part in organizing. But he then uh, uh, organized the Southern Christian Leadership Council, which had almost no staff, no real infrastructure, uh, was uh, uh, half a dozen or so uh, African-American preachers uh, associated with Martin Luther King uh, with a a secretary, an office manager who really ran the whole organization out of her office. One of the interesting things about uh, Martin Luther King and the um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference was that it was often a movement in search of an event, and that would come into play later on. Sometimes the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, uh, was portrayed in the national media as the instigator and the leading force of the um, civil rights movement was indeed neither the instigator nor the leading force. In fact, if the SCLC had not had Martin Luther King um, Jr. As its, as, as its principal member, it would have been uh, yet another of the many organizations that uh, attempted to promote civil rights. Um, in, in movement style. Okay, so what happened with the Montgomery bus boycott? It lasted 13 months. And finally, um, the, uh, after walking and catching rides, African Americans made their economic power felt and the bus company relented, re getting rid of segregation uh, by race on, the, uh, on public transportation. Now, de facto, white people quit riding the buses. So buses became segregated simply because white people um, uh, quit using them. This took a couple of years. Well, the, uh, um, the, the NAACP um, continued to look for cases. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference continued to look for causes. Uh, the MIA was Montgomery specific. It continued to exist. Um, and after the success of the Montgomery bus boycott, things kind of churned along, some of the steam was taken out of the movement uh, because the Eisenhower administration uh, shepherded through the 1957 Civil Rights Act, which was all uh, um, uh, um, uh, thunder and, and um, uh, noise, but very little oomph. There, there wasn't much to the 1957 Civil Rights Act. There were no teeth um, to the 1950, there, there were no, there was no enforcement mechanism. There was no penalty. It simply said that you could not discriminate on the base of race in education or public accommodations, but there was no enforcement mechanism. Um, eventually, it would become the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with enforcement mechanisms, um, but in 1957, that kind of sucked some wind out of the movement um, as it was intended to do. So you see this great gap between 1955 and 1960. But in 1960, in February of 1960, um, students at uh, North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College began a sit-in at the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. They simply walked in, four students, they sat down, and they asked to be served. And when they were not served, they stayed at the lunch counter. The idea here was that African Americans had spent large amounts of money in the Woolworths and in other downtown stores, but they were not permitted to eat lunch in the place. They could get a lunch to go, but they were not permitted to, to eat lunch. They were not permitted to sit down. They had to go. They had to leave the store. They could spend their money, but they could not take uh, um, 
take up accommodations there. Um, hence, second class citizenship. Four of these young students sat there. Uh, they returned the next day. The, uh, the counter people didn't make a big deal about this, but they also did not serve um, the, uh, uh, the boycotters. By August, of, I have it listed here as August 1963, um, there had been 70,000 people sitting in at lunch counters. This movement spread like mad. There had been 3,000 arrests across 50 cities. Um, this was a tremendous um, spread of the movement across the South. Uh, uh, pretty quickly in Greensboro, um, other students participated within a couple of weeks. There were about a thousand uh, students and townspeople participating in these sit-ins at the lunch counters um, in Greensboro. And uh, they gave in pretty quickly. All of the lunch counters um, gave in, the Rexalls, the, the Woolworths, everybody, because they just realized they could not um, uh, withstand this onslaught. In July of 1960, uh, the, the sit-ins at Greensboro were, um, uh, were done with. <clears throat> but they did take place in 50 cities um, to August of 1963 with, again, 70,000 participants and about 3,000 arrests. Also, a lot of assault, a lot of battery occurred, not just getting punched, but as you'll see in a second, a lot of um, uh, attempts to humiliate the, the, those who sat in. And this was interracial. Also, we see at churches, kneel-ins, that is, people would go to church to pray, and they would simply go into the church and kneel down. We see wade-ins at beaches. This is particularly true in St. Augustine, uh, Florida, and in Biloxi Gulf Shores, Mississippi. Um, and sometimes this led to rioting, and, and, and uh, most of the time it did not. It was supposed to be peaceful protesting, just appearing um, and making your protest known. Then in 1961, we see um, uh, the recurrence of the 1947 um, uh, rides, uh, Journey of Reconciliation in the so-called Freedom Rides. Uh, again, in 1946, the Supreme Court had ruled against segregation in interstate transportation and CORE had tried to test the policy with its 1947 Journey of Reconciliation. Well, CORE, following the NAACP, had, um, had sued Virginia. The case is called Boynton versus Virginia in 1960, in which the Supreme Court ruled that segregation in interstate accommodations of any kind were unconstitutional. So CORE members, Congress on Racial Equality members, including John Lewis, who is now an Atlanta area uh, member of the House of Representatives, decided that they would test uh, these public accommodations, both in seating on the buses and in the waiting rooms uh, in bus terminals in the deep south. And so beginning on May 4th, 1961, uh, and running through what was supposed to be May 17th, an integrated group of about 20 bought tickets from uh, 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 Washington, D.C. to Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, to Rock Hill, South Carolina, to Atlanta, uh, to Atlanta Georgia, to Anniston, uh, Birmingham, Montgomery, Alabama, to Jackson, Mississippi, to New Orleans. This was supposed to last from May 4th through May 17th. One of the riders was arrested in Rock Hill, South Carolina, a black rider for uh, uh, standing in the white only waiting room, which was not supposed to be white only. White only if you were intrastate, white and black if you were interstate, but how do you split that difference? And the local authorities decided not to even try. In Anniston, everything chucked along between Rock Hill and Anniston, um, pretty well through through South Carolina and Georgia. But then in Anniston, the bus, the bus was attacked. Um, it was forced off to the side of the road. Fire bombs were thrown through the bus windows and the bus was set on fire. It just so happened that the riders were able and the bus driver was able to get off whereupon they were attacked. The, another bus came out and picked them up after long hours of negotiating, took them to Birmingham where 
the uh, police commissioner, a fellow named Bo Connor, who we'll hear about later, said that he knew exactly when the bus was coming in, but the police couldn't possibly provide protection until about 15 minutes after the bus got there. Nod, nod, wink, wink, and the Klan viciously and foolishly attacked uh, the, the uh, riders in Birmingham. These riders scattered, and it was not until the next day that a contingent of new riders from Nashville um, came to Birmingham and took up the Freedom Ride. These new Freedom Riders left for um, New Orleans from Birmingham on May 20th, and the same thing happened in Montgomery. The, the police did not arrive, allowing the Klan to assemble and attack riders. The feds, the feds had their marshals out there, but the marshals were, were not able to, to keep order. Um, eventually, a, um, um, a compromise was reached between uh, Attorney General Robert Kennedy and um, uh, the governors of Alabama, which was John Patterson and uh, Mississippi and that the riders would be allowed to go to Jackson, Mississippi under police escort, whereupon they would all be arrested and imprisoned for 60 days for violating um, uh, state statutes, which were illegal, according to the Supreme Court. Well, politics being what it is, uh, the Kennedys wanted um, uh, Southern Democrats on their side and not the uh, uh, diverting to the Republican Party. Um, so, so all the Freedom Riders were arrested. Other Freedom Riders took their place. And Freedom Rides continued into 1962. Uh, but the, the Freedom Rides did have um, one significant victory in that the Interstate Commerce Commission implemented new rules in imposing the Supreme Court's decisions in seating and facilities as of September 1961, and they, the ICC could enforce these rules um, against the bus companies themselves So, uh, by, by dealing with licensure. So eventually, the, uh, the Freedom Rides did what the sit-ins at the lunch counters did, and um, won the day, but it was a long, hard haul and didn't occur even in 1960 or 1961. Well, let's look at some photographs now. Here are the um, uh, two photographs about the lunch counter sit-in. Uh, you see the uh, Greensboro, North Carolina sit-in in February. This was a picture from the very first day of the very first one of these lunch counter sit-ins. And then you see in, in 1963, Jackson, Mississippi, um, how white Kids are dumping uh, food stuff. This, this one guy has sugar, dumping it over a, um, uh, a person protesting segregation um, here. Let's look at the Freedom Rides in Anniston. You can see on the left the route of um, the Freedom Rides. Let me see if I can draw here from DC down in this direction, along here. And then it stopped in Birmingham. It was picked up again in Birmingham out by people from Nashville. I'm circling. Okay, now drawing a line, went to Montgomery, and then over to Jackson, then was picked up again in Jackson and went down to New Orleans to be completed um, much later in the year. This is a picture on the right um, of the bus burning in Anniston. Now, don't do this stuff. Don't, if, if you're going to create terror, don't do it in front of TV cameras or in front of news people. Uh, this is something we should have learned from the, um, uh, from the civil rights movement. You don't show this stuff off. <clears throat> Alabama and the South in general is remembered not for the good things that have come out of the South, but for this picture and for another picture that I'll show you in just a minute. This is from 1961, for crying out loud. It's, it's been 50 years. We can't live this down. 
the center, the most segregated city in, in America, and the center of what everyone knew was going to have to be the confrontation between civil rights, public accommodation forces, and forces of massive resistance in public accommodation was going to have to be Birmingham. Everyone knew this. Um, this was not the only place where, where uh, uh, such interaction occurred. There were a lot of other places where local actions or even um, uh, actions that brought in Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference occurred. Um, but Birmingham was the linchpin. And Birmingham had to, uh, had to come about uh, because it was the linchpin, but also because Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference had lost momentum. They, they had attempted to create uh, this momentum by creating a stir in, um, uh, in Albany, Georgia in 1962. They had been the Southern Christian Leadership Conference um, seeking national media attention, uh, had asked uh, Martin Luther King to come to Albany, and the sheriff of, of um, Doherty County, which is where all, uh, Albany was, the police chief of Albany, um, both decided not to, the police chief's name is Roy Pritchett, uh, decided not to um, confront and not to arrest King and the protesters, but to simply allow the protests to burn out. Um, and, and Bull Connor could have done the same thing in Birmingham, but he chose the hard route. He also wanted it photographed to show how determined he was and how wrong African Americans were. Well, this just blew up in his face, and he should have known. So after a fruitless um, uh, campaign in Albany, and the Albany people thought that uh, King deserted him too quickly, um, they, they moved over uh, to uh, Birmingham. They were called in by Fred Shuttle, Shuttlesworth's organization. We, we tend to forget that it's the local people who were already running these shows. They called Martin Luther King in to get national media attention. Um, frequently, there was a lot of uh, disputation between the local leaders and King who wanted to control what was going on. Um, you know, there was a fight over control um, and a fight over who was going to get the credit. But King and his crew came in, called in by um, um, uh, Ralph, I, I, I'm sorry, Fred Shuttlesworth, and um, they already had in their pocket a plan for Birmingham. They called it Plant Project C for confrontation. Now, they knew they could get confrontation from Eugene Bull Connor, the police commissioner, because he had threatened confrontation and he had been confronting Shuttlesworth and crew um, in the protests that were already going on in downtown uh, Birmingham. So Birmingham had passed an ordinance decreeing that the parks would be, um, uh, would, would not be um, uh, integrated, that black people simply could not go to public parks and would be arrested if they went to public parks or set foot on public parks. Um, and this was enforced with large contingents of the police. Well, um, this was just perfect for Project C for confrontation, in which demonstrators would force the desegregation of downtown stores and accommodations by filling the jail, embarrassing the local police, um, and, and having mass arrests that would come in wave after wave of demonstration, forcing the police to arrest them for being in the wrong place, but not for violence. Um, and indeed, that's what was so devastating to the local authorities was that these were nonviolent protesters confronted with um, uh, um, very violent acts. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the response to Project C by Bull Connor led to um, other, uh, excuse me, other uh, people in Birmingham trying to change the form of government as well as hold an election in Birmingham. And so there was a major shakeup 
in Birmingham's government uh, that that occurred at the same time as this 1963 spring project C. On um, uh, project C began on Friday, April 12th, which was Good Friday, and Martin Luther King was jailed on Good Friday, one of the first people arrested. He sat in jail, refusing to be uh, bailed out, and a, a, a group of ministers published a letter in the uh, newspaper asking him to cease and desist, that they would work it out themselves, which led to uh, King's statement, and this is one of the things that really did change King from, from kind of an opportunistic uh, leader with good intentions to a great, inspiring uh, leader. His letter, uh, I'm sorry, I've got it written here, his letter for uh, the Birmingham jail, it's letter, letter from the Birmingham jail um, on April 16th, which was the closest thing that the civil rights movement ever had to a single um, statement of purpose. Well, probably the, uh, the linchpin of the whole Project C for confrontation was the children's crusade on May 3rd and 7th. By May 3rd, by, actually by May 1st, the ranks of protesters had been pretty well thinned. There were hundreds and hundreds of people in jail. And some organizers suggested to school kids that they come out for a protest march on the 3rd and the 7th. And kids as young as eight were out at this protest march. Many of them cut school. Uh, this was a big scandal. But they were there doing what they thought was right. Parents allowed this. Um, and this was the point at which Bull Connor turned the dogs and fire hoses loose on these marchers. This was all caught on television, and Connor wanted it caught on television, but it totally backfired on him. And um, ultimately, uh, Birmingham businesses did, did desegregate in June of 1963. Um, it was in April and May of 63 that the new government came in, and for a while there was uh, the old government refused to give up uh, its offices. The new government couldn't take the offices. Um, there was a um, there was a fight between these two that was settled in court. Uh, Birmingham businesses understood what was going on, and the Chamber of Commerce uh, made an arrangement to desegregate. Well, even though that occurred and Bull Connor was ousted, he he lost his mayoral campaign um, and faded from the political scene thereafter. The um, uh, the court desegregated Birmingham schools. It was uh, schools were supposed to open a week uh, prior to September 16th, but the desegregation order came through, and so they put off opening until September 16th. And in response to that, then on September 15th of 1963, the 16th Street uh, Baptist Church was bombed. Um, and, and uh, resulting in the death of four young girls. Um, this was done by a number of Klansmen, including uh, Dynamite Bob Chambliss. Uh, Birmingham had a reputation uh, that was so bad is that Birmingham was often called Bombingham. And there had been 50 bombings between 1947 and 1965, of which the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing was probably the most um, publicly horrific, even though it wasn't the biggest. And people threw bombs on each other's doorsteps kind of constantly. Let me, let me restate that. People didn't throw bombs on each other's doorsteps. The Klan bombed people, sometimes white, most often black. They would throw bombs up on the doorsteps, and uh, it would blow up front porches. Sometimes it'd blow up entire houses. Many people were killed. Many people were injured. Many people were intimidated. And the worst of these was the 16th Street Baptist Church. Um, that did not prevent the desegregation of schools. Let's look at some, uh, at a couple of pictures, I think. No, just one. This is the Children's Crusade. These are older uh, students, probably uh, 15, 16, 17. 
possibly 18, on either May 3rd or May 7th, when the firemen taking great delight in aiming their fire hoses at people's heads. If you've ever dealt with a fire hose, you know they're not fooling around. Many, many people were washed down the street, clothes were ripped off, people suffered injuries uh, because of this and because of the dogs being turned onto, uh, uh, onto these protesters. These were from, uh, these, these pictures were nationwide and really caused a backlash. Um, Bull Connor did more to desegregate um, uh, um, Birmingham and, and public accommodations in Birmingham than any other uh, major official just by being hard-headed about it. Well, later that year, and in fact, between the success of Project C uh, and the 16th Street um, uh, Baptist Church bombing, um, uh, African Americans in support of John Kennedy's uh, civil rights bill that he had introduced in the summer of 63. Remember, summer of 63 is when um, George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door. All this stuff was occurring in a very short period of time. Um, Kennedy announced that civil rights was a moral issue, not just a political issue. And um, so he introduced the civil rights bill. They also, um, the Kennedy administration introduced a jobs bill as well. And so in support of that jobs bill and that civil rights bill, organizers A. Philip Randolph, remember the old uh, World War II threat to bring blacks to D.C., um, A. Philip Randolph and Baird Rustin, who doesn't get nearly as much credit as he ought to because he was a communist and because he was a homosexual, um, in the annals of, um, he doesn't get as, as much um, credit as he ought to in the annals of civil rights movement history because of those two strikes against him. Um, anyway, he was an incredible organizer, organized, Philip Randolph was the titular head, but Bayard Rustin organized the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom that took place on August 28, 1963, um, in which Rustin created this march from nothing, made sure that everyone was fed, made sure that everyone arrived on time, made sure that everybody got out of town before nightfall, 10 hours they were in town. Um, because Washington, D.C. could be a little bit of a sundown town. That is, uh, black people were required to be out of town by sundown or face vigilanteism. Um, anyway, uh, on the centenary of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, which was supposed to go into effect, uh, remember on January 1st of 1863, um, the various civil rights organizations had been pressing uh, Kennedy to make such an announcement. Uh, he finally kind of sort of did in June of 63 with his um, uh, civil rights bill and the federal job program. So this was the rationale, the centenary of the Emancipation Proclamation and support for these two bills. This was the largest um, political demonstration in the United States to that time. Estimates are a low of 200,000 to a high of 500,000 in and out in one day. And there was not only enough food, but if you've ever been to a large gathering, the most important thing, toilet facility. Baird Rustin made it happen. Here's an image of the march on, a couple images on the march on Washington. The one to the um, uh, left shows you sort of how many people this is taken from the Lincoln Memorial. The one on the right shows Martin Luther King, who again was not the featured speaker. He had a very minor role in all of this. John Lewis was the featured speaker. His speech was a little too radical for um, public consumption really in the media. But Martin Luther King uh, delivered his I Have a Dream speech as a postscript to his prepared remarks. And that caught media attention as it was designed to. And it, it launched, excuse me, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, just like the letter from Birmingham jail, had launched him from an ordinary man with a gift to an extraordinary man in an extraordinary uh, time and situation. Okay, so uh, 
the second of the three great areas of concern for African Americans in civil rights uh, we have discussed, that is public accommodation. And thank you for your attention to this long lecture.